Good evening. Uh, welcome. My name is Karen Lewis. I'm an associate professor of architecture at the Knowlton School. And it is my honor to welcome all of you to tonight's Baumer uh, lecture given by Mass Design Group. Uh, Michael Murphy and Christian Benema have uh, graced us with their presence so far for what will be three days of an in-person uh, class conversation with our architecture graduate students. And so it is such a delight to have both of them here in Columbus, um, zooming in from just down the hall. Um, but we're really thrilled to have Mass as our Baumer seminar recipients um, for the 2021-22 school year. Um, the typical Baumer seminar begins and often continues with an intensive deep dive into the history literature in context of contemporary practice. Recent Baumer recipients have been in practice for decades. So Sana, OMA, Scott Cohen, Eric Owen Moss, to name only a few recent offices who've been part of this fantastic endowment. But the invitation to Mass Design Group represents a decided shift in attention. To begin, they're a relatively new practice. Begun in 2008, while the first two principals were still in graduate school, the office has rapidly grown to include more than 200, I think, or is it maybe even 300 at this point, architects, landscape architects, engineers, builders, furniture designers, writers, filmmakers, and researchers, representing 20 countries across the globe. The extreme newness of mass positions them in a funny way. Their practice is moving faster than the theories typically augmented by the academy, aligning more closely with on the ground social justice movements and just in time deliverables of the modern economy. So to this end, a continuous close read of presupposed literature is inappropriate at best. Rather than critical positions, mass sounds the critical call to action. Although I certainly think that there are plenty of critical positions inside of their work, but the criticality of what we must do and how we must conceive of architecture is resounding in all of our students and all of our thinking as we began this three-day engagement. We believe in expanding access to design that is purposeful, healing, and hopeful. It's Mass's website. So if I were to take a moment and compare this statement of purposeful, healing, and hopeful, to another statement from another Baumer office website, which says, their firm continues to investigate that urban exchange in a search of an alternative design tactics, methods and techniques will obligate and modify both the building and the city. And I wanna take a minute and compare these two statements, hopeful versus modify, healing versus techniques, purposeful, versus obligate. This represents change in vocabulary and an important shift in how we conceive of the work that we do as architects. These are powerful positions. Mass Design Group, standing for Model of Architecture Serving Society, harnesses architecture's urgency by asking for spaces, buildings, strategies, and plans to take immediate and decisive action towards an architecture that, quote, promotes justice and human dignity. This is a global networked 5013C corporation complete with a board of trustees. They're media savvy, producing far more podcasts and video talks than perhaps academic articles, although there are plenty of those as well. They are partners, bringing their architecture expertise as a partnership rather than a commission to the communities and institutions they serve. And finally, on a more personal note, it has been really such a pleasure to work with Mass as we've explored some of their other projects, namely the uh, Gun Violence Memorial Project, which the students at Ohio State participated in helping with a um, object collection and to learn more specifically about that project. It was very powerful to meet with one of the community members who has been most positively impacted and healed by the work of Mass Design Group's project, Pastor Jackie Robinson, uh, Pastor Jackie, excuse me, Pastor Jackie, who really shared with us the impact that the work that Mass Design Group has 
um, inside of the communities, both in terms of the urgency of the practice that they engage, but also in terms of the humanity. And so it is really such a great pleasure to bring so many different community members together tonight and to warmly welcome and thank Michael and Christian for joining us. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having us. Karen, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you so much um, to the Baumer Fellowship, to the Knowlton School, to the faculty and students. Um, we're deeply honored uh, to be here with you, to have this prestigious opportunity um, to be uh, part of this amazing series. And uh, we're, we're really humbled by, by the chance to be able to engage with you uh, in a critical way and in a direct way through the work uh, of our practice uh, as we grow and as we learn from where you're, where you're going with your own students and your own teaching. So we're just grateful to be here. Um, I want to begin uh, just with some uh, with some critical uh, consideration of, of how we might frame uh, the work and also the where we see architecture today and, and how we've been engaging it directly. Um, I'm Michael Murphy. This is Christian Benimana, just in case that wasn't clear. And we're, uh, we're two of the principals at, at Mass Design Group. Um, we've titled this lecture, Breathing is Spatial, and, um, uh, and I want to discuss what we mean by that. I wanted to kind of begin um, just to recognize and acknowledge where we are today uh, in this pandemic. You know, this image taken at rush hour in lower Manhattan uh, at the World Trade Center train station um, uh, reminded us how only about 18 months ago time really stopped and our entire world changed and our future uh, looked more unlike anything that we as architects, but certainly we as publics have been able to predict. You know, epidemics have always done this. They reveal the cracks in our systems. They are a divining rod of sorts, a stress test, if you will, that inevitably locate um, which one of our cultural, our social, our physiological, our infrastructural systems are fragile and which ones are resilient. Uh, they are inflection points and they show us where we need to invest to change and to think anew. But they also reveal to us both how we can uh, think about return uh, and the future that might be possible that we didn't think was before. They also reminded us, I think, about this crucial lesson that at least I've gained, we've gained from the past year and a half, which is that this is something we've said, but I think it's become really true that design and and by that sense, architecture is not a neutral profession. It's not a neutral thing. Our design and our spatial decisions, they have great impact on our lives. They have impact on our health and on our behavior. And this idea, this idea of behavior change in architecture has been debated in design circles for decades now, you know, whether or not we should be in the behavior shaping industry, whether designers hold too much power or are too aspirational or utopian in their hopes of shaping change. But suddenly everyone knew, um, now huddled in their apartments, afraid to enter restaurants, scared of hospitals and public spaces, everyone knows that the buildings around us, they hurt us. Uh, and if they can hurt us, the obvious next question would be, you know, could they also heal us? I think the other reflection that we have from the last um, year and a half, is that um, that new rights have been revealed to us in, in this period of time uh, and how those rights are impeded. Now, our ability to breathe, breathe air, is both a crisis of health access, but it's also a crisis of access to the fundamental right to breathe. We have seen how the built world, that thing we as designers shape, has kept clean breath from communities and will continue such triage after this lecture and for generations to come, that the buildings we are in, they could determine whether we have access to air that is uncontaminated, is healthy, or is poisoned, is really a reckoning of architecture, but also an opportunity to ground the work we do in the most basic of fundamental rights, the right to breathe. 
With that in mind, the discipline of architecture and space, whose relevance is so often bemoaned, really becomes grounded and essentialized in the last year to make space and by proxy to make architecture firmly in the, in the realm of rights averted and abused uh, instead of in the realm of goods and services purchased really opens up, I think, new potentials, new responsibilities. But more foundationally, it links breathing as a spatial problem. It links breath to space and therefore our work as architects and designers into the realm of rights. It's a powerful moment that we are in and the public is asking us to respond to. It's a complex kind of critical idea, but I, I find that we, we've looked to, to try to ground this in a set of theories in order to really answer the question, well, then, so what? How do we act within that heavy responsibility and accountability? These are, these are questions that have certainly been asked before in architecture, but um, I was really inspired when I learned of the work of Johan Goltung, a Swedish peace theorist, who kind of theorized how to think about injury and violence um, and what he called the violence triangle. Um, and describing those types of injuries that we might face in society in different scales and in different typologies so that we can differentiate which is which and also address them in new and con in constructive, productive ways. So we want to use this triangle, this tripartite structure of injury in order to project both the lecture tonight, but also um, strategies that we might think about the role of, of spatial disciplines in answering the call for how we might address the rights that we are seeing disrupted in the work around us and the built environment around us. The structure very simple is that there are different types and scales of violence or injury, the physical, he calls physical violence a, a, an event, something that happens directly between two people, uh, structural violence, that which is systemic and injurious across our systems, hard to see, but is affects everything that we do and cultural violence, that which, is impacted or influenced by ideology, by um, uh, group alignment, uh, by social order, by ethnicity, uh, and by religion. The flip side, of course, of this is if that is the case of such injury, so too is the possibility of, of resolve, of healing, uh, of outcome. And so we use this uh, as the structure of the lecture, and we want to begin here with that first part of a physical healing, which I'll have my colleague Christian talk about. Thanks, Michael. Um, um, I think when we talk about physical healing, we, you know, obviously think about um, the work that we do in the realm of healthcare. Um, but then it's heartbreaking to learn that sometimes the systems that we put up do not necessarily always support that mission, um, uh, let alone uh, contributing to hurting further. Uh, when an epidemic of extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis emerged in a town called Tugela Ferry in South Africa, it was a building that was, um, that deserves like majority of this blame. The mode of transmission, uh, particles so small um, they suspend in the air, uh, easily inhaled by patients in a poorly ventilated hospital with overcrowded waiting areas. Um, was the proof that something special uh, was to blame for this. As one healthcare doctor stated, the hospital was not designed for infection control and people died because of it. Such a diagnostic points the unique role that our work, architecture, plays in contributing to a cure. If space can be purposely designed, they can assist in the prevention, containment, uh, even treatment of infectious diseases, um, and more recently, including COVID-19 that we know of. And that uh, is really the premise um, of the foundation of our work, uh, our first project, the company, uh, Wutara Hospital, um, was designed and thought with this idea of um, 
purposely uh, deploy architecture to contribute to the healing of patients in this particular hospital and prevent uh, nosocomial diseases or airborne acquired infections during hospital stays um, to a minimum, if not eliminating them fully. Beyond that, um, the campus itself, uh, not just uh, the, 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 the medical treatment that the patients receive in it, was designed to promote generally wellness of not just the patient, but everybody that is there. So this connection to human that is scientifically proven to improve uh, generally our well-being was prioritized and um, carefully crafted uh, to as much as possible provide that healing environment. Um, obviously, this hospital was anchored in a very specific location uh, in Butaro, Wodera, Rwanda, that has specific climatic conditions, uh, that has its own uh, ecological conditions, and that has a set of environmental factors that we could base off of our assumptions to try to come up with the best strategies to achieve all these goals that we had in mind. Um, the best one that we, I can point to very easily uh, was um, a number of things. Um, the airflow, natural airflow through the building um, in the way that uh, the site was sitting on top of the hill and take advantage of this drift that come from the valley all the way to the top of the mountains and positioning the buildings and sizing the width of the building to be able to maximize this uh, passive uh, system that will allow a fresh air intake uh, from the side of the building uh, that it gets lifted up as it gets hot within the buildings then be treated before it exhausted outside of the courtyard and way above people sitting and walking around these outdoor sitting areas. Rwanda is blessed with the climatic, um, uh, the temperate climate, sorry. Uh, and we say like one of the lessons we learned from together Paris, South Africa of poorly ventilated hallways and waiting rooms could be solved by putting all of these in well ventilated areas that are semi covered outside. But beyond that, the opportunity of sitting on the hill also allowed us to separate the traffic flows of people utilizing the hospital. Um, not everybody that goes to the hospital is a patient. There's also administrative staff that walk in and walk out of these facilities every day. And having the opportunity to separate their traffic pathways through the campus from the patients above is also like a physical embedment of these measures of trying to remove opportunities for infections uh, as much as we can. So these are things that we have the power to uh, intervene in as architects and designers that but oftentimes we do not give enough consideration as participating actions towards healing. Um, then the last one I'm gonna talk about um, is um, understanding the relationship we as individual will have as part of this larger spaces uh, that accommodates uh, many of us. Um, research has shown that patients recover slower when they're um, actively reminded of illness and looking at other suffering patients. Uh, so a simple act of flipping the beds in open wards and having patients having a view through the window and outside of the courtyard or across the valley uh, is scientifically proven to improve the recovery time of patients. And these are things that we architects and designers have in the power of our hands and our minds to do 
to decide where to place that window, to decide the width of that window, or to decide where that window looks uh, out to. And this is something that is going to have an impact in the lives of thousands of patients that are going to rotate through this facility over its lifetime. And it's through interventions like this that we believe uh, we're able to actively contribute to the healing uh, that takes place through this facility uh, over time. And then um, we also um, want to make sure that the facility serves the people it serves the best um, uh, of their level of understanding of how to navigate these complex systems. So in rethinking this ward at Botara Hospital, um, little details of um, what type of uh, colors uh, that we need to create this space, in addition to using them to be uh, indication of signage for a, a population that still struggled with um, uh, literacy, was also like carefully thought to make sure that the type of like mode we want to create in these rooms that supports the type of healing we do also has a function in a way that if patients are looking to get to a ward but they cannot read the signs with words are able to follow that same color throughout the campus and be able to find their way so it's little things like this um, that really if you are they're carefully thought about can have this um, ripple effect and create uh, a little bit more opportunities for healing. Yeah, the Batara campus was our <clears throat> test of, of so many of these ideas that the building itself performs to increase airflow. And in, in doing so, we dove deep into the history of airborne disease, infection control strategies, historic examples of how hospitals had, had implemented strategies to improve air. Uh, and then um, uh, we've worked on that research for the last uh, 12 years in multiple different examples. And so when the COVID-19 outbreak occurred, we were immediately brought into conversations about how we might actively and urgently retrofit spaces around us um, to think about, again, uh, making our buildings breathe. And what was so kind of crazy about this sort of um, moment was how it was recognizing, I think all of us, how few of our, our buildings really do breathe well, um, that the systems we put in place, which we couldn't afford in Butaro, and so we didn't implement there, were, were keeping us from getting access to the air changes necessary per hour, air changes per hour necessary to uh, reduce infection rates, that natural ventilation or, or fresh air was not necessarily being pumped into our buildings, um, and that the bigger the floor plate, the, the lower the probability of getting fresh air uh, and natural ventilation into the building was, was there. And this happened in hospitals that are of the highest caliber in, in our country. Uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, during the height of the outbreak in April of 2020, uh, reached out to us uh, to see how we could support them as they actively were redesigning the spaces that they were in, the hallways, uh, in order to create the kind of triage and urgent ICU units for the COVID patients at the first surge in New York. And um, with their research team, John Bukavales, who we had actually worked with in Cincinnati 10 years ago at, um, here in Ohio, um, was looking at ways in which the, the hospital was itself become, was evolving and changing in order to address the urgent needs of the outbreak and, and how the spatial literacy, what they called it, of the professionals in it um, was variable, uh, that they were given some strategies and some things that were legible and some things that weren't legible, and that more spatial literacy was maybe necessary in order to protect healthcare workers, which of course were getting sick during the outbreak, which is the sort of canary in the coal mine. Uh, if healthcare workers are getting sick, uh, we know that there's a, a systemic and structural problem inherent in, this, in, the, in the facility itself. So we worked on a couple of simple exercises, including GoPro cameras attached to um, some nurses themselves so we could monitor without being in the facility, the way in which their spaces were being redesigned. We also worked with clinicians to sort of map their own perception of what was clean, dirty, infectious, uninfectious. And as you can see in these three examples, just with simple CRAN exercises, this again during the height 
of the outbreak that there was a different understanding of what was safe and unsafe and how they should monitor it and manage. And even these simple exercises allowed um, the, the, the COVID team and, and the medical staff and professionals to kind of be self-aware and spatially aware of how they might better control or create controls to protect the patients and protect themselves. Um, both in terms of donning and doffing, in terms of which areas were closed and open, in terms of which areas were undefined. Um, and this just simple analysis, but also engagement, um, helped us start to see that the need for this active triage of our spaces was possible and also necessary in not just the top medical institutions in the United States, but across every space that we were in. So we began a series of a public uh, um, publicly available uh, guidelines for how to retrofit spaces like restaurants and nursing homes and housing and public realm, uh, how we might think about, uh, of course, medical spaces, but also working with uh, anyone who would call us up to, to help assess both what the challenges were and create some sort of overarching general guidelines for that typology of building. And of course, the general conclusion is that, of course, all of these buildings have to breathe and for us to be safe and all of them are resistant to breathing well. Um, uh, and some of their old designs, including here in Mount Sinai, were the old buildings, which had operable windows, the ones before air conditioning, were the ones that they, re they retrofitted more rapidly because they could breathe more effectively. Uh, this uh, kind of conclusion uh, that what we used to do uh, before the advent of mechanical ventilation everywhere uh, might offer some solutions that we might return to. Um, it was both a kind of humbling, but also troubling uh, realization of how much work there is to do uh, to reconfigure our built environment so that it breathes more effectively and reduces the daily injury that we might face today and in the future. I wanna to go to the next kind of category of violence and healing, uh, which is of cultural healing. I'll pass it to Christian to talk about that because we've also engaged in projects that are deeply about uh, the role of culture in addressing our own trauma. Thanks. I'll talk about a project that we've worked on that is not built yet, but it has very much um, informed how we approach this type of work. A little bit of background to those people who are uh, joining and don't know much history, I'll, I'll try to summarize. Uh, Gwanda, my country where I come from, and the, the birthplace of mass design group, um, is a, it's a beautiful, nice country in uh, Eastern Central Africa. Um, uh, following the colonial era, I went through a series of uh, uh, political crises uh, that eventually led to uh, the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis, um, which is probably like the lowest humanity uh, as we know it has ever come to uh, so far. And uh, following uh, that, um, unfortunate event, the country has gone through um, serious uh, efforts to heal itself, uh, both uh, economically, culturally, uh, but also like emotionally. Um, so when we worked on this project, um, the, Chiga the Chigari Genocide Memorial uh, African Center for Peace, um, we were looking at um, the kind of like efforts the country has gone to recognize that difficult past uh, and yearning for a better future and recognizing that uh, it is uh, both the individual and the collective efforts uh, of the country that is eventually going to get us there. So um, again, a little bit of background history about some of these efforts the country realized early on that it is critical to uh, invest ourselves in a process of um, peace and reconciliation. Um, and we went through a series of um, interventions that included uh, traditional based uh, courts uh, that processed thousands and thousands of perpetrators of the genocide um, and engage them in a conversation of uh, recognizing their act and demanding forgiveness from um, the victims and the survivors, uh, but also uh, committing to uh, participating in reconciliation. 
And this process included um, the first phase uh, was critical to its success because the perpetrators had to recognize what they've done. Uh, and then also the, uh, the, the victims and survivors had to be given the space and opportunity to share uh, this story and what it meant for them. And this happened in public places and um, people would then like uh, share these, both these stories and then the jury that is composed with elders, at least a few that were left at that time, the wise will then like decide and hand over these verdicts based on um, how they understood the community. Of course, there are some guidelines to it. So in understanding what that process looked like in our mind and what it aimed at, this structure of a personal narrative or the personal experience uh, became the foundational of understanding what this space is supposed to be and constructed like. Uh, so this simple room, uh, this simple space that allows everybody to feel like they're welcome to share their personal story has to be the foundation. Uh, but then by extruding physically what that space um, is going to be like, uh, allowing like more light, more air um, to kind of like not create a sense of like isolation while you're doing that, um, became then like the unit that like is going to now multiply and create um, uh, or, or mimic uh, the story of that, uh, sorry, the, 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 the sense that our individual stories make our collective efforts to try to heal. And by changing um, the size of these units, and then you start like having leftover spaces and then can create this, um, that can support the entire building. And as well, you know, again, mimicking that in constructing our collective future, uh, the am uh, amalgamation of these individual stories is what is going to be the strength of building this nation. Um, and that start creating this uh, public space that is accessible, um, yet can provide also like private spaces that people can be intimate in, that can isolate in if they want uh, to try to engage with all these testimonies that have been collected through this whole process. Um, and, and really uh, be able to represent this sense of hope uh, that we, we believe that this story are going to create for a better a better future for the country. I think the you know it, what we learned what I learned um, through through this project and working with Christian and, and our team there is just the transformative power of telling stories, exhuming history, and letting it live and breathe in order for us to let's say put some of the past. Uh, uh, visible to the public in order to heal ourselves. And this was certainly the case with our project, which opened in 2018 in, um, in Montgomery, Alabama, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice with the amazing Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative. Uh, this project began uh, as an effort to come to terms with the history of the lynching of African-Americans in the American history from 1880 to 1950 and the incredible atrocity perpetuated against black individuals of our nation without recognition, without truth telling, hidden, lost his, to history, erased, their stories buried, um, and um, their histories, their lives uh, forgotten. This was an effort to start to rewrite that historic and horrific atrocity, uh, and also for our nation to begin a process of healing and truth telling. Um, we, we designed this project in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative uh, to really create a, a site of pilgrimage, but also to create a journey uh, through which we transform ourselves and how we uh, engage or address or think about uh, that information, um, learning about histories we don't know, um, engaging it, being able to sink into us, feel discomforted by it, and then come out with action. In fact, these stages of transformation uh, that Brian Stevenson talks about, um, we saw as an opportunity to actually spatialize very simply uh, into uh, vignettes uh, that as you journey through this project, it's a very directed uh, and specific journey. Um, it's not um, 
it's it is hierarchical. It's not uh, uh, for you to find your own journey. It's a specific one, and uh, you go through these different moments, these different experiences, in order to come out with action. Identity matters. And discomfort matters. Getting proximate. He talks about the narrative change, and of course, at the end, finding hope. And the uh, the vignettes themselves are are modulated by the relationship of the visitor to this marker itself. The marker, uh, two feet by six feet by one feet, one foot, uh, the size of some degree an individual human body, uh, which represents counties in America where these, where these lynchings occurred and the names of those that were brutally killed uh, uh, in those counties. Um, as you move through the memorial, you descend uh, the ground drops and suddenly these markers, which look like columns or caryatids or uh, objects holding up the roof are then suspended by the roof uh, and you get to be beneath them. The sense of compression and discomfort, uh, the sense of uh, being underneath uh, and floating above you are, are those, those narratives, those stories, those places, uh, a remapping and a rearticulation of the nation itself along the lines of this violence. As you carry forward into a deeper realm of the memorial, they rise above you to the point where the legibility of the individualness of each county is, is made impossible and the collective understanding of the vast, uh, infinite realm that we are engaging in uh, in the memorialization space is made present. This kind of chapel space uh, is punctuated by uh, a water wall pouring over uh, board form concrete wall, board forms, boards recaptured from historic Alabama um, uh, sheds from the turn of the century, uh, from the 19th century. And, um, uh, and the light of transpiring uh, recording time across the floor uh, as you sit and uh, remark uh, at the history that we are only starting to understand. Uh, as we uh, continue, there's a, a sort of break in the structure where a double cantilever allows for uh, a sort of passage to the center uh, and the hill uh, beckons us uh, to the top of it, the hill which then allows us to look over the markers themselves and see the structures of power within the city of Montgomery, uh, the river, the courthouse, um, the capital steps. Uh, the structures of power which have allowed and been complicit in these uh, atrocities, but also um, a sense of rewriting of the kind of spatial hierarchies within the city itself. Uh, that now this is the second tallest hill in, in the city, uh, re representing the city of Montgomery upon its efforts to uh, wrestle with and, um, uh, and commit towards uh, a sense of uh, social justice. Finally, outside uh, is a second memorial that's uh, part and parcel of the first, which is that these markers are replicated uh, in, uh, into markers that can be claimed by you as a visitor and brought to your home county. What we learn from the Rwandan uh, genocide against the Tutsi week, the commemoration week, where individuals would bring uh, uh, re-inter bones uh, uh, in a ritualized effort um, to uh, bring uh, individuals that were found or loved ones that were kept uh, or objects into an active live grave is that the act of memorialization, the ritualization of bringing and leaving, praying and, and um, committing is also, uh, is also how we as individuals, as humans, um, have historically always participated in the act of memory making. But it's also about inscribing that action uh, in a tactile way, not just in a didactic way. So here we're given tools. You can claim a marker, you can, you can do something, you can make action, take action, uh, and uh, build the seeds of that resistance and that reclamation in your own town. You can orient this other thing into your thing. Um, and you can see that the movement of those markers uh, that will 
kind of take over the nation, 805 counties uh, throughout the nation. This kind of active cultural transformation uh, uh, is something that has been um, a profound uh, part of our work. Cultural transformation work has been a profound part of our work uh, the last couple of years and taken on a whole portfolio of work in, in the space of memory, including what Karen talked about, which was um, commemorating a current epidemic, the epidemic of gun violence in America. When we opened the Memorial to Peace and Justice in 2018 in April, two amazing women uh, came up to us and so they just walked through the memorial and they wanted to tell the story of their two children. This is Pam Bosley and Annette Nonsholt. Pam and Annette uh, handed me business cards with their organization Purpose Over Pain and the images of their two sons um, on the back who were murdered on the streets of Chicago uh, innocently uh, from, from acts of uh, gun, random gun violence. And they talked about the ways in which their narratives have been suspended and surrendered into a national narrative of numbers and data, um, but their lives, individual lives have been erased, that their dignity, their, their hopes, their dreams were unmoored, erased, and um, not given the space that they deserved. Um, Pam talks about wanting to see her son again, and not just in other acts of collective epidemic, but in, in their individual lives themselves. Um, we instantly thought that this was a powerful thing, and we worked with our partner, Hank Willis Thomas, to try to enact a memorialization process that might think about gun violence uh, differently. Um, and as we learned in Montgomery, as we learned in Kigali, the active participation is crucial to the active memorialization. It's part of that healing process is getting involved specifically. And in the era of gun violence, so much of what we see are these tributes that are left on the ground after an act of especially mass violence, like we saw at the Pulse Memorial killing in Orlando. But we also see it on every day efforts that leaving something, some tribute, some um, memento, some memory, uh, giving, contributing, uh, is also a way of uh, unloading and, and leaving behind uh, that, that, that trauma. Um, and so we asked family members uh, of victims to contribute objects to this national memorial to choose something and donate it in a sense, although if they want it back, they can get it back, but to contribute, to participate. One talismanic thing uh, that then becomes a representation uh, of their loved one uh, inside of this broader collective action, the story. Uh, and then we would take each of these objects and put them in a glass brick and 700 glass bricks would create a glass house, a glass house um, 700 people are killed a week in America and uh, 100 people a day and seven and four of these would be one month in America. This notion that these houses, these receptacles would then continue to collect objects over time means that each one is a story, each one a punctum into a life curated by their family members, but together each one, each person given uh, identical space in order to represent that and next to these objects next to each other, uh, uncommon or unfamiliar relationships and similarities emerge, commonalities of histories um, are sometimes happenstance, happen, happenstance or, or unintended, but these spaces allow us to engage with the conversation themselves. This We were inspired by, uh, of course, another incredible memorial project, the, the AIDS Memorial Quilt or the Names Project, which uh, itself was a participatory active memorial to a current epidemic when the, our political um, establishment was unwilling to acknowledge the, the atrocity of the epidemic of HIV. Uh, this act of collective quilting and narrative construction changed not just the nation, it changed culture, it changed policy, and when placed on the National Mall, uh, became spatialized in a way that was unforgettable. From this, we learned that uh, culture change uh, is essential first to change uh, to make social change, not the other way around. 
uh, and it's through culture uh, that we can affect policy. And so we hope as we continue with the gun violence memorial project that we uh, will then bring 52 houses to the National Mall, 52 representing both all 50 states plus DC and tribal lands, as well as 52 weeks. So 36,000 objects representing 36,000 stories and one year of gun death in America, um, telling a story of an epidemic we must find new ways to address. Um, I wanna finish with the third category of uh, finding structural uh, strategies for a healing uh, as well. And here I'll pass to Christian again to yeah. talk about Christian. So um, even though we're gonna shift in terms of typology and use a whole different area, I think uh, to Michael's point, it's this um, understanding how cultural healing needs to happen to inform policy change, then we can now um, you know, start addressing a more structural um, uh, things and challenges that we have uh, in our own communities. Uh, in Rwanda, battling this uh, long history of um, identity politics uh, that you know, led to a genocide, uh, and now like emerging from there, trying out to address more structural problems that are um, either used as an excuse for the creation of this type of uh, identity politics, um, it's probably the next best step to now like making sure that we at least uh, solve these problems for uh, uh, for uh, the future. And in the specific context of Rwanda, this will be land. Um, uh, on this map shows uh, basic usage of land uh, in the country for agriculture. Uh, the majority of the country survives from um, agriculture. Um, that is very uh, traditional. Um, and you can see how growth uh, arable land in white has grown in the span of 27 years, uh, less than 30 years. And this is uh, made worse by the fact that uh, by 2050, the country is expected to double its population, which means the availability of individual land is going to be even further uh, reduced uh, to a minimum. Uh, yet the need for agriculture production is going to only increase. So we have this challenge basically of uh, reconciling these two poles where uh, the land area of a person is re continually reducing, but the need in terms of like output uh, of productivity is increasing. Mm -hmm. And this problem is made worse by uh, the impact of climate change. Um, as well as like the, uh, the, the, the decrease in terms of like agri uh, agriculture land uh, capacity to produce based on the practices we use. So this project uh, was born out of a collaboration between Gwanda and the Howard Buffett G Foundation, Howard, Howard G Buffett Foundation, to try to understand what a model of conservation agriculture would look like um, to prioritize um, figuring out how to double or triple the agriculture output on the same amount of land without uh, further degrading the ecological environment. Uh, actually, um, rather than degrading it, strengthening it so that it can also support uh, in improving this, um, uh, this productivity that we need from the land. So in reimagining this campus, our approach uh, was to think about it from a One Health perspective. Uh, One Health uh, is this theory that uh, our lives and animal lives and the, ecologi the uh, ecological life are inextricably linked and we must maintain a healthy balance between those two things if we want to maintain um, a healthy ecosystem on this planet. And so the, the kind of like approach to this campus was looking at how we can best achieve this ecological balance through a few things. Um, the first one uh, is to try to understand uh, opportunities for ecological restoration. Uh, how do we restore bio, 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 uh, biodiversity? 
uh, on the site, which obviously in, in return is going to help strengthen the ecological uh, system and the agricultural land production capacity. Um, number two is create healthy living and working spaces uh, for the campus. Uh, obviously, we had to build some buildings and, and we have to understand how we can do that in as healthy way as possible. Um, and then uh, improving the soil health, obviously, was part of like improving the agriculture output. So those are the three things that we looked at. And of course, it had to be anchored into the specific context of Gwanda. Um, again, for some of you who don't know the country, it, it is uh, called a country of a thousand hills means everywhere there's kind of like a typical section of the land that we occupy uh, that conventionally has been not used optimally based on the position of the section of the land relative to the valley or the top of the mountain so we're trying to understand how uh, you know back in the days like this ecological ecosystem functioned so that the campus can in a return be designed and planned around how like that particular ecosystem was originally intention to design and how we can plug in our campus in a way that is less disruptive as possible. Um, so we, we've done a lot of work about this campus, which is a whole different lecture um, that we would like to give at, at a different time. But uh, the, the simple uh, understanding is, is like, our intervention through this campus, um, the way we generate and utilize energy, the way we, um, we source water, manage it, treat it, and put it back into the water systems, um, the way we manage wastes on the site, uh, the way we have tried as much as possible to reduce the embodied carbon that went into the buildings, uh, the way we have uh, put up strategies to restore uh, the natural ecology uh, of the existing um, uh, preserved landscapes so that they can be a big part in, again, like the restoration of the biodiversity on the site has resulted into a radical ecosystem that we think is going to um, provide this advanced sequestration of carbon, which in return we think is going to allow the the, the, the campus to be uh, climate positive uh, in under 10 years. And we, at this point, believe that this type of like intervention at all scales is what I, is going to allow us uh, to breathe better, allow our buildings to breathe better, and allow our planet to breathe better. And beyond that, um, we uh, are convinced that the, the, the best way to do this is to engage the communities that are part of this same ecosystem to provide these spaces. So we build a network of over 85 plus manufacturers across the country, the craft centers, the design enterprises, local entrepreneurs to come up with these solutions as much as possible. Um, Almost 98% of Likas River was sourced within 160 kilometers, which is the entire country, by the way, because it's such a small country. Uh, but the, the best is to say that it is possible for us to engage uh, in the creation of these solutions, but with the proper identity of the context, it's, it's, it's very, very important that that type of um, opportunity in creation um, leads to the identity of the place and the output uh, as much as possible. These are some of the photographs. The campus is still under construction, a lot of earth-based construction, a lot of natural fibers that are, that are, that are existing in the country and utilized in other things like crafts, uh, but also uh, a lot of dependence on like local crafts and traditional um, uh, wicker work and, material handling that has led to the creation of these beautiful spaces. Um, and then I will pass it on to Michael to speak about uh, some uh, intervention of the similar scale uh, in the context of the 
United States. I, I just want to close with this last example in in our context here in in Ohio in the Rust Belt in in where I come from and in the what I would call the fringe city uh, in in upstate New York. I'm from a small town called Poughkeepsie, New York, a once vibrant, thriving industrial uh, center on the Hudson, 90 miles north of New York City, <clears throat> which over the last um, half deck, half century has faced, like many of our smaller cities in, in the United States, um, decline, uh, population loss, uh, infrastructure investments that decimated its downtown, like the pervasiveness of the surface parking lot during urban renewal. Um, and the kind of destruction that we saw with federal investments in infrastructure seeking to aspirationally build cities that would grow bigger than they were at that time. Um, the kind of misdiagnosed efforts of infrastructure was a kind of experience that I grew up with. And one of the reasons I decided to be an architect, knowing that um, so much had been des designed by planners and architects and so much had been wrong about it, I had at least thought. Um, this condition, uh, which is not the condition just of my own experience, but of the experience of so many places in the United States, and in particular, uh, the kind of smaller city that has lost its manufacturing base and lost its industrial base. Um, but these places still exist and they still matter. There's uh, people that still live there, this culture that still exists there, and there's a sense of a great um, abandonment across our nation as well. Uh, in thinking about what happened historically in urban renewal, uh, why things went wrong, but also where there are seeds of um, new types of renewal and seeds of innovation. We began a research project around uh, these cities uh, in the United States, the hundred or so fringe cities that we uh, have been studying uh, that are at the kind of edge condition, uh, both in terms of uh, a kind of, you know, both using the term fringe as a sort of um, uh, the, the frayed build fabric, but also the kind of fringe condition of innovation and change that might be necessary in order for us to rethink uh, urban design in a, in a kind of post or post market condition or a sort of radical strategy against uh, the sort of typ typical market based development initiatives that so far have not uh, been successful uh, in these smaller towns across the United States. And we also looked at um, the kind of the evidence, the collateral of designers, the beautiful books and plans and and visions that were were sold uh, to the public in order to accept these big interventions. And if we are to um, think about the federal, the next great federal investment in infrastructure, which is you know now being passed and debated today, um, we must also understand what went right and what went wrong historically in the past, and a more nuanced understanding of that. In order to do so, we uh, set up an office in, in, in Poughkeepsie in an abandoned building and uh, kind of squatted in a storefront to create a dialogue with the public around a different way of thinking about their, the relationship of uh, design and planning to what might happen in the city. And um, in 2017, set up a team there. And uh, in 2021, um, you know, la this last year, uh, opened a purpose-built new space on Main Street, and have been involved in you know a dozen or so projects in in these in these years, and have seen incredible change uh, and also incredible opportunity uh, to to see how the architect and the designer can be a, more of an activist role in, uh, in 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 between the let's say the for-profit, nonprofit, and public sector to advance and push forward projects that may not have the support uh, from the market, but do have the support from the community. Uh, and I'll just talk about two of those. You know, one of those projects is thinking about the historic creek. I mean, the city of Poughkeepsie is uh, is exists because the mill runs and the um, the factories that were built along uh, the old energy of the mill of the creek that ran through it. Um, that creek has been um, abandoned uh, and sort of seen as a a dumping ground for everything from shopping carts uh, to, to air conditioners, and um, we. <laughs> like literally walked the creek to see it as an asset instead of a liability and have been working on, you know, using the role, using this kind of skills of the designer, which is uh, to try to imagine and envision it as something else, piece by piece, something that can be invested in. And we're seeing the opportunity to do a major infrastructural landscape project of the scale 
um, which will require, you know, a decade of work or more, as well as, you know, lots of federal and state dollars in order to make it real, uh, getting buy-in as well as um, leadership from nonprofits and local uh, civic leaders. Um, and thinking about that as a, as a role of the designer way upstream is sort of advancing projects that are necessary uh, that have buy-in, but don't have a pathway towards success is something that um, is something that we see as the role in the work of affecting kind of structural inefficiencies and ineffectiveness. Um, last, um, in doing this kind of more broader uh, civic and infrastructural urban design scale work, actual architectural projects have emerged as well. And um, one of the abandoned factories on the creek uh, on Parker Avenue had been there. I'd only ever seen it abandoned when I grew up there, kind of an example of the sort of um, lack of uh, this sort of reliance on, on manufacturing and industry in order for cities to survive. Uh, this old factory was going to be demolished and a nonprofit, uh, the scenic cuts one of the great environmental nonprofits in the area uh, reached out to us about a new headquarters and we encouraged them to invest in this, his, this historic abandoned property and make a kind of case to stay in the city of Poughkeepsie. And this project, um, this is an environmental nonprofit that has fought for the protection of the river um, uh, and have been a leading voice in uh, in reconsidering our and how we conserve uh, our environment is now seeing their role in the built environment as, as equally as essential. Much like Christian talked about with the RECA project, it is these historic structures in our country that whose carbon has been spent. You know, their their bank is uh, uh, is actually in good condition. Their carbon has been spent so they can be reused or rethought in creative and constructive ways. Um, towards a sort of carbon net positive on day one, in, in, if reconsidered and rethought. Uh, this project now, which will house our headquarters in a new nonprofit center, is just looking again back at how buildings used to breathe. Uh, I bring this back to the top, the old factory, which had large apertures of, for light and air, of course, for the, for the toiling labor of, the, of that period of time. Uh, and the lack of mechanical systems in order to support them. Also, you know, as the mechanical systems were introduced in the mid-century, you can see in the top, they shrank those uh, apertures, uh, that fenestration to be just a very small window. So just reopening that introduces um, all sorts of opportunities for air and light and, and, and making this building a breathable one. And then simple strategies like a kind of chimney effect in a new atrium that we punch through the old historic floor plates, uh, beautiful timber beams that we can reconsider or, or um, reuse in constructive ways, allows the building, um, and this is a sort of an image of a before and after, if you can believe that, uh, here is another before and after, um, using simple but also innovative strategies of natural ventilation uh, as well as a sort of unique um, introduction of, of customized, localized uh, air uh, air strategies on each of the apertures uh, allows us to make a building that is uh, functional, uh, breathable, is uh, uh, climate positive on day one, but also it's taking that idea that buildings are breathing, need to breathe, and we can think about all of and reconsidering and redesigning our buildings as they once were and to some degree and as they should be in the future. So I think I say all this to, to close, which is that, you know, as we reimagine the world around us after this incredibly challenging and traumatic uh, two years that we've faced, and many of us have suffered uh, significantly, and some of us still have suffering to come, one of the great realizations is how into, intricately woven our built world is and how necessary we as designers are in trying to rethink it uh, and advocate for a built world that promotes justice and human dignity and allows us to breathe better. So thank you very much. And thank you, Christian, for being here. This is all mine. I hand it to you, Karen. I'm, I'm watching the screen to see when we go side by side right now. I think we um zach is the, oh here we go i wasn't sure what kind of purposeful awkward silence we had at that moment thank you very very much michael and christian thank you so much for sharing so much of 
your um, your work with us and also for framing it in such an interesting way around these issues of of physical, cultural, and structural justice, right? Um, not just violence, but also the the kind of opportunities or the spatiality um, that comes with some of those terms. I think um, maybe just to kind of open things up a little bit for us, I'm wondering, um, there seems to be a really interesting overlap with how I think your practice thinks about the performance, the productivity, the activeness of the built environment. That reminds me very much of how landscape architecture um, or landscape architects speak about uh, the realm that they work in, um, about productivity, about uh, you know making a landscape that gives back, that has a larger ecological system that is both human, ecological, um, material, spatial. And I don't think we've, I haven't heard architects speak about those overlaps as much. Um, it really struck me that there's a, a vocabulary and a language of a kind of a, a landscape performance. And I wonder how maybe your recognition of thinking so systemically has shaped the way that you've approached your practice. I was going to unmute. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Karen. I, that's a great, it's a great way to frame um, uh, some questions about how we might think about the work. I mean, I, we, we've often said that, and I think a lot of this lessons, lesson, a lot of these lessons come from thinking about hospitals themselves, which we might ground some of, some of the, the response, but you know, we, we've said from the sort of beginning, and I think this is, it's not something that we alone have said. I've heard this before from sort of Giancarlo Carlo, Carlo, but architecture uh, is a verb and not a noun uh, is one way to describe it, that it's a sort of living thing. And, um, you know, when we treat it and we pay for it and we describe it as an object, we, reinforce its commodification and therefore it's sort of deadness. It's a thing that we monumentalize and only experience monumentally. But if we think of it as a living thing that lives with us and fights against us and, and at times works and at other times doesn't work, we may imagine it differently and, and, and expect more and less of it at different times to adapt with us as we adapt. And this is certainly the case of the hospital. It, it may, I would say more broadly, it's the case of the institution, but the hospital is a, is truly a living architectural specimen. It is constantly being adapted and redesigned on the fly by, you know, staff uh, and, uh, and even patients who are re you know, sort of acclimating to the environment as their needs change. But even institutionally, the hospital is always under construction. I mean, certainly here in Columbus, I'm sure you have many examples of that. It's the case everywhere. And the kind of architectural, the fixity of the architecture as a sort of object in the hospital just doesn't actually re reflect the way it, it functions and works, not just through airflow, but through its, its management, its systems, its operations, its needs. And what I imagine is that the, the lessons that we learn from medical facilities, that they're constantly under construction and constantly being adapting to new um, needs, is uh, I think a, a lens through which we might read the built environment to ask of it other buildings, you know, all buildings, to ask of them to be more um, uh, evolutionary, uh, adaptive, and living, mm. uh, much like you talk about landscapes, which are inherently, of course, as you said, regenerative and restorative mm -hmm. and ecologically dependent. We have. I think clouded our own way of reading the built world in such a way. And if we open that up, it kind of introduces, I think, a range of possibilities for how we might describe buildings differently over time and through multiple experiences instead of, you know, successful or unsuccessful, instead of the sort of binary of object or, you know, uh, non-object. Uh, and, you know, that we might be able to introduce a different vocabulary of how they need to function over time and, and through time. That question of vocabulary is something that you brought forward today in the seminar that I thought was very provocative. 
which um, to recap for those of you that weren't there, um, side note, I'm supposed to remind everybody that um, we will not be taking any audience questions right now for time. We're going to kind of keep the dialogue going inside of the the uh, the Zoom room, if you will. Um, and notes. <laughs> but um, one of the things that um, you spoke about in terms of vocabulary was expanding the way that we thought of buildings and of architecture and architects as being um, tied to human rights, to the rights of humanity. Um, and I think that's another transformative vocabulary shift. Um, maybe bring some of that forward into the way that we're thinking about the three areas um, that you brought forward for us tonight. Yeah, do you want me to attempt to respond to that? Christian, yeah, uh, why don't you attempt this, right? <laughs> uh, thanks. I, I think I think it's it's uh, it's interesting to to try to link. Uh, the question of rights to to this conversation. Um, personally, the, the the need that I see in linking those two things, uh, first of all, stems from the the fun. I mean, the fundamental belief that we have at Mass that we hope everybody gets to understand is that you know if we agree that the goal of uh, of our work, the outcomes of the design process, is something that is. Um, it's not a product that can be bought, but it's essential and needs to serve a purpose um, that advances our community towards a positive future. Um, then you need to question the quality that it needs to have. I often say um, that my personal motivation is not grounded in, um, in the fear of what might go wrong, uh, but it's grounded in the optimism of how good things would be if we get it right. And when I say that, what I mean is that um, I believe in our collective efforts to try to do better uh, personally, but also collectively. And the only way to do that is to uh, not only to remove the injustices that we find in our communities presently, um, but addressing our collective aspiration, individual and collective aspiration at the same time. And for me, um, when we tie architecture to this question of rights, uh, we're not only talking about the communities that have been deprived of these rights. Yes, that needs to be talked about, but it's not the only focus. And, and that's why I think, Personally, I like to, co to correct people that ties our work to humanitarian architecture. That's not what we do. I think there are many aspects of that that we need to do to correct. And it's a constantly evolving conversation and efforts to try to address injustices that we see when we see them at that time. But more importantly, it's about uh, pushing our collective um, uh, I think uh, the, the, the vocabulary is evading me here, like our collective uh, state of consciousness towards um, the community we want to build. And architecture plays a big role in that. So if we talk about uh, making sure that people have the fundamental rights uh, that they deserve, and if we participate in that conversation, then we have a good and strong foundation we can start from and build um, opportunities for prosperity and healing. Um, I don't think that, I don't believe that it will be uh, in a place where like um, life on earth would be uh, perfect. And similar to what Michael was describing that, we need to understand architecture as this living, ever evolving um, process and, uh, and um, ecosystem. I don't know if I can use ecosystem in that in that in that in that in that in that, uh, in, the, in that sense. Um, it's how I also understand our collective effort in growing as a community, as a society, where we are constantly seeking opportunities to improve our lives and our 
uh, our planet. I don't know if that makes sense. If yeah, I mean, I don't think we can. I, I think asking it from the counterfactual would also be helpful. You know, so you know, what rights are impossible to achieve without the execution of, of built environments that allow them to be um, um, sort of accessed? And you know, I think the case in Rwanda is certainly an example of that. You know, without this commitment to memorialization, you know, true. Uh, reconciliation. He, true reconciliation. I think, it, yeah, it's not possible. I mean, the, the, the it's a profound, it, it's a sort of profound realization that the country is investing in infrastructure that it makes it essential to actually overcome a history of trauma, a history of incredible, incredible atrocity. And other countries have committed to the same, same commitments. I think we're only starting to begin that here. I also think the other question of introducing rights-based narrative into architecture, it, it also both essentializes what we do, but offers us opportunities to ask questions about what other structural systems might be deployed, um, uh, legal structures, policy structures, uh, judicial structures, if it's rights-based, that then can uh, demand a higher caliber of things like you know, housing, healthcare, education, uh, infrastructure. Um, these conversations are being had, uh, but without the grounding inside of a, in a rights-based discussion, we don't have the legal framework in order to demand more of the kind of appropriate infrastructure that's necessary for those rights to be accessed. So I think we have that moment now um, that'd be worth us thinking about collectively as professionals and designers and you know in the academy, how we, uh, Take it, take that opportunity, and really um, charge forward because it could have lasting impact on policy, on legal structures, on accountability, and on the expectation of the design professionals to sort of contribute in a more productive way uh, than they have been asked for in the marketplace. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, what's what's fascinating about what you're bringing forward is it's asking a bigger bigger questions about how do we want to live and what's the, what's the important, um, what are the important values that we uphold in how we live and how do we facilitate those lives? Do you think, Michael, you're sort of thinking, I can tell. Well, I think the public is asking us that, you know, there's a yeah, I think when I, say we, I, I guess yeah. I'm meaning me as a human, we as humans, not just we as professionals. Well, I think, I think the, I think that gets to the point of, and the other thing we didn't talk about much today, but we talk about a lot, which is you know, the ultimate goal is the construction of dignity, you know, and that the emergence of dignity, that the, the notion that we as individuals matter, no matter where we are, that we are seen, that we, that we have a space that's been purposely designed for our individual needs that gives us a link to imagine our lives as better. I think that's what you're talking about. That's the sort of emergence of dignity being instilled within us. Yeah. And the built environment produces that all the time. It also produces the opposite, you know, incredible indignity uh, when we are in, you know, medical spaces like I've experienced that are so horrendous that you wouldn't, you couldn't imagine having solace or, um, or being healed in such a space, but it's, I think it's everywhere in our, in our built environment. And we, by focusing on that other distribution of rights, the right to dignity, um, that we also affect every day. I think we also have other opportunities for thinking about what our role is in, in the world. I mean, I think many professions are asking that question about dignity and architecture is asking how, what are the spatial implications of that dignity or what are the, you know, material or the building implications of that dignity. Christian, you said that your office does not offer or is not a humanitarian. Uh, it does, it's not humanitarian architecture. Tell us more about that because I think that's a really valuable point to clarify and I want to draw that out some more. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm not saying it to say that there's anything negative about being humanitarian, but I, I think that the the type of interventions that we attribute to humanitarian has a sense of urgency and temporality that I think architecture cannot afford to engage in. Um, so 
Mm. Uh, the reason why I say that is because uh, I believe good architecture is a process that requires time uh, and a lot of consideration. In that, um, the time that architecture um, provides adequate solutions, uh, the 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 kind of like a type of like immediate uh, type of needs has to be either uh, at base uh, already thought out or already solved uh, for the architecture to take place. Um, and I think this is, I mean, tying back to what Michael is saying, like what are other systems that have to feel the pressure for this change so mm -hmm. that these things can change? That's why I'm, not, I'm saying like, I don't believe like architecture processes are necessarily designed to provide adequate solutions uh, in this type of like, uh, like quick and immediate uh, solution. Not to say that it cannot contribute, but it's not designed to be the most effective um, uh, solutions offering in that particular space. And because of that, uh, I think it, it, like I want to say basically like for architecture to be effective in our communities, like it needs to engage in deeper conversations uh, that hopefully can prevent these type of challenges that create humanitarian needs not happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we are engaging in humanitarian crisis, we've already failed uh, as architects, as designers, uh, we're already working, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I want to. I would answer that question. Um, add to add to Christian's point as well, which is just in terms of a framing of the of the vocabulary of the of of our profession. You know, I, I think the use of the term humanitarian architecture, which, while I, I think acknowledge and and commend uh, architects investing time and resources into you know disaster, into emergency response, into seeing how they can be deployed in unique and creative ways. And how the how issues around the world are always and forever spatial. I think that's an important also discussion. I think I think the separation between a humanitarian architecture and a what a non humanitarian architecture is like an unhumanitarian architecture. I think we have to acknowledge that the sort of ca the counter of the humanitarian is that somehow the the profession the capital a whatever you how you want to semi describe what you're re referring to is not serving other people yeah it's not relying it's not it's not responsible to or accountable to the same very questions that the those engaged in a kind of social humanitarian project are engaged in and that that reality is a really i think dangerous one right that we would not hold the entire profession to the expectations that we would hold the entire, you know, the built environment to be accountable to. I also think it's um, ungenerous, not not of you, Karen, but I think when when that bifurcation, when I, I would say that that what has been called the false dichotomy uh, that um, is deployed, that it um, doesn't acknowledge the incredible work of so many architectural practices that are fit that are working within the current market condition and doing incredible public service all the time that's unheralded or unacknowledged. And there are sort of everyday noble efforts by individuals in offices, by great practices, by, you know, um, of, of trying to fight for the public, fight for the environment, fight for a better built environment and, uh, and not called humanitarian or not called, you know, a social project, even though it's embedded within that long history and long trajectory. So I think we do ourselves and the public a disservice by allowing a kind of separation or a false dichotomy. And so Christian's point is not just that we can't allow for that, but we have to demand what would be the, what would be a world where that dichotomy exists, because that one is a world that's really terrifying. Right. And it's one that is also something that we should flirt with, you know, that we can somehow be unaccountable to the impacts of the work that we do. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I challenge us all to, and it's it's embedded within myself in the way I I was taught. You know that that dichotomy is embedded in my own thinking. I have to always pull myself out and remind myself that there's a kind of tripartite structure, much like Goldtongue is showing. It's not injury and it's not like healing and violence. It's like a you know a continuum of violence, a continuum a continuum of healing. Um, there's a tripartite structure also 
as we might think about our our own work as as professionals, not mass, mm. uh, and, and its impact on uh, on the kind of human condition. Yeah. Now, thanks, Michael, to articulating that uh, more beautifully than I could. But I, I think back to the triangle that Michael was talking about. Right? I, again, I don't know if you take like the geometrical sense of it, like a triangle is like, the most stable uh, geometrical form. Like it's really hard to, to break it. So I, I feel like we need to understand that for us to be able to press on all those three points and be able to 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 heal uh, when like the and the destruction causes us, like, you know, expand the triangle. Um, and then we also, architects, need to understand that we need to uh, approach these type of processes from multiple angles, not just as professionals. Um, I often tell uh, designers in, in our office that our primary role is not to be architects, actually, it's to be good citizens. Like, that's the primary role we have in this world. We happen to be architects, that's the trade we've learned that type of like framework of thinking that we are well versed in and our contribution to society comes through that angle obviously but any of us could have been a doctor a lawyer it doesn't mean that our contribution will have been less but within that realm we need to understand how to do it better so uh and then that contribution i think is what we need to bring uh, like all together at every single time and you know, every single interaction and in addition to that we also need to be um, the kind of like a recipient of uh, what our, our proposed solution is supposed to be. And what I mean by that is, um, I think is disingenuous for an architect to design a school they will not send their children to go to. I, I honestly think that. Um, but I don't think that it, it is to say that if you design a school as an architect, you should send your child there. That's not what it means but at least you should be comfortable with the idea that your children can go to seek uh, education that. Or if you design a hospital, it's a hospital that if you feel injured or if you get injured, you are comfortable going to seek healthcare in that. Now, of course, it's, it's not to say that, you know, the architecture solves all those problems. If you can design a good hospital and it doesn't have good doctors, it doesn't have medicine, it doesn't mean that you should, you should seek healthcare there. But at least from a spatial standpoint, it has to be to the standards that is applicable to you. So for me, the way of like connecting ourselves to the physical uh, violence or the physical healing, uh, to the cultural uh, destruction or cultural healing, the structural uh, destruction, the structural healing, for me comes from those three things. It's like, what is my place as a citizen uh, or as a recipient of the architecture processes and solutions? to me as, as a recipient, if I was the person, if I was in the shoes of the person who's going to sleep in this bed, what would I want to, like, to get out of this process or this outcome? And then from a cultural standpoint is, as a member of this society, what is my contribution to make our society better? And then from a structural one is, uh, as an architect, as somebody that uh, society has put in a privileged position to be able to think in a certain way, be able to act in a certain way, be able to effect change in a certain way. What is my contribution to this structure, systems running our society to be able to change things for the better? So that's how like, I want to frame it and not like in, a, in, a, in a bits and pieces that we pick from left and right and we leave everything else on the table. I don't know if that makes sense, but a round board of that. <laughs> I think it's beautifully um, shared, both of you, um, such thoughtful and I think rich ways that you've clearly spent so much time um, thinking about and positioning the work, but also doing the work and doing the type of, I think, emotional work that comes from being a citizen of the world or, or somebody who's showing up to um, care for the communities that they're actively engaging in and participating in and asking questions that go beyond just, what do I design here? But what is the affect? What is the meaning? What is the implication? of the ecology of design that I can bring forward here. I think it's very beautiful and, and very inspiring. Um, we're going to wrap up our questions or wrap up our dialogue here, and we'll have lots more to discuss over the next few days. But maybe one question I wanted to bring forward um, to sort of close our session tonight is 
Um, early in the semester, the students found themselves, I think, very quickly and immediately overwhelmed with the gun violence memorial project and they're stepping forward to do that work so actively and you could sense in the way that the students were speaking and how they were writing there was a real struggle in how to what is mine to design what how much of this problem do we step fully into and what is it at what point does an architect become um you know, um, I'm trying to think of the right vocabulary word, but at what point is there a kind of egocentrism of solving problems? And then at what point are is one sincerely and proactively stepping forward to participate in a process? And so I wonder if you could share a little bit in closing, what's the boundary? What's the system boundary around where you practice? Um, and how do you how do you engage with such big and difficult questions without being overwhelmed by them? Thanks for that question, and you know, thanks to the students for you know, stepping into that space, which is challenging, very challenging, very difficult. I think that's par partially one way uh, <laughs> to to be to to deal with the overwhelming nature of so many of these intractable problems is to just weighed in you know and and to have a, a way in uh, often gives us the kind of tools to see how we can be effective in that space so I, again i when i talked about that in montgomery i say it's it's i've learned this from memorials so some memorials you leave kind of traumatized like bludgeoned by the horrificness of the human condition and the possibility of atrocity and you know while those are necessary uh memorials are, are needed at, at moments in time i found the more successful memorials are those which both shock us and awaken us but also give us tools in order to cope with that um that trauma and um you know we learned that in rwanda the sort of act of ritualized memorialization i think we see it in South Africa. We saw it. We see it in Germany. You know, we, and there's good and bad examples. Um, and one of the theories of memorialization that we pulled from from that work is what my colleague Jadi Amazi calls the intimate and the infinite. The great memorials, great me spaces of memory, um, are able to link us to uh, are able to spatialize what you talked about is the overwhelmingness of the horror of the of the trauma that is that that overwhelmingness that's the infinite that sense of the infinite that it goes on forever that we can't fully capture it that it's too vast to to understand mm -hmm. and yet gives us a way in to the individual human dignity of a, of a of a single person a punctum into the process so that to link the intimate to the infinite that is the I think the role of the memorial, see how, how it matters to me, why it's necessary for me. So um, as I read the landscape of memorials and as they emerge increasingly, or as we've seen them historically, um, I'm looking for those, I've been inspired or informed by or learned those that are both spatialized, the vastness, and also give us access to the individual in some way. Um, so I, I hope that's an answer a little bit to your question. And, and as I you know, return to the gun violence memorial, then the role of the designer is not to design the experience as much as it is to design the frame that will allow the intimate and the infinite to be expressed. And so for us as the, ar the architecture, specifically of the gun violence memorial is not, um, it's not prescriptive, but it's framed, right? That each space is identical, um, that it's composed in, um, in a, a house. You know, the house has form, it has Jungian kind of logic to it, you know, that we can kind of have, we can project the, 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 the space of the domestic as that place of both nightmares and dreams, right? Hopes and horrors. Um, it's familiar and yet unfamiliar. 
So there's, there is architecture in what it evokes and the role of form making, it must evoke, it must, you know, must transcend what we understand of that form and then bring us through it in a new way. The glass house obviously has metaphorical and now, and now um, metaphorical uh, meaning. Um, but in the end of the day, it's still spatial and it creates conversation and dialogue and it creates interaction. So when we presented the memorial in the Chicago Architecture Biennial, watching family members go into those houses and have conversations with other family members they did not know about their brick was just, in, just incredible, you know, and sharing those stories of their loved ones and bringing those objects to life and describing why they chose them and finding solidarity mm -hmm. across generation, across culture, across uh, location. Uh, it was truly, truly amazing. And so I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, so I, I think there's an absolute role of the designer in order to create the frame through which we can experience both of these very difficult, but also necessary transformations. The other way to ask that question is, um, what is impossible to experience without spatializing it? And this is where I think we learn a lot about, again, the role and the necessity for design and architecture to be a partner in the kind of productive cultural work that's necessary for our communities and nations and countries and others, our ideologies, uh, you know, to evolve, which is that there are things that can't be transcended without spatialization. And um, memorialization is certainly in our opinion, but I think history and cross culture sort of as evidence of this is one of those one of those areas. You know, um, so we might think about again what we can't not do um, without the work of the spatial disciplines, and therefore give it its meaning, not its, um, and give it its role, and and not um, uh, paralyze it in a way, uh, paralyze us in thinking that we are only doing something for ourselves and not for others. You know, that sort of role of the architect of being uh, the presumption that the architect is out for their own agenda instead of the agenda of the public. Um, so I think, I think, anyway, I'll stop there. I think that's where it is in my mind, the intimate and the infinite. And I encourage us to think about and discuss that in the, in the next courses. Well, uh, Christian and Michael, thank you so much for this talk tonight, um, and thank you for your presence and attention today and for the next few days. Um, and thank you to all of you who are watching um, from your desks at the moment. Um, it is our pleasure to have you all here with us in this conversation. So thank you all very, very much, um, and good night. Thank you, everybody.